Hello, my friends. Welcome to another episode of Deep True Crime. I'm Manny Rodriguez. In today's episode, I want to share with you how did they catch up to Brian Koberger? How did they use genetic DNA to catch up to him? Let's go ahead and dive into what we know. You got to ask yourself, like, how did they easily catch up with this guy once there was genial once that DNA stuff was made public. That is, I mean, that's pretty interesting of its own, wouldn't you say? I think that, you know, I think that they did get some of his DNA through the family stuff. Someone did did the, the one of those public DNAs, and we'll dive into that a little bit here. But how did the cops use genetic DNA to get him that to me is pretty interesting as well because they tracked him down by tracing his distant relatives through genetic databases then they secretly collected a sample of his DNA which they matched to that found at the crime scene that's what experts have revealed that's what they are saying happened you see they tracked him 2,500 miles from the crime scene. Now that he's due in court for his extradition hearing, we continue to find out more. But they did confirm over the weekend that he was tracked down by a combination of DNA tracing and investigative work. That is literally what they're saying. But you see, we always had the question is, like, he wasn't in the system, right? How did they get DNA from him? If he wasn't in the system, he did not commit, he didn't have a prior record, he didn't have any background that showed a problem, how did they get him on? Well, there there could have been a method that's known as genetic genealogy. That is what is said to have been found, how they found him. This is an increasingly popular and useful method of investigation where law enforcement traces suspects' relatives on Ancestry website. I recently did a video, I think I did the video, or I'm going to do the video. No, I did the, the boy in the box. You can check out my channel, I'll put a link in the comment. The boy in the box, who was killed, who was taken away from this world uh, like 50 plus 60 years ago in Chicago area. Until now is when they found out who this boy is. They did not had, have an identity on this little boy for generations. Literally, they did not have a any, they didn't know who this kid was. He had died, he was, they knew that he was, that his life was taken. They knew that part. They finally identified him as Joseph Augustus Zarella. And it all started with familial DNA is how they found him. One person bought a D DNA for his girlfriend for Christmas. She breaks up with him before Christmas, so he does not give it to her. He says, let me do it myself. And that's when it opened up some serious wounds. It opened up a lot. And there's a good chance the person who's actually responsible for unaliving the child may not be alive at this time. Because this was, we're talking about 1957. And he was found in the most horrific way. Check it out on my channel. I'll link it, I'll link it, the story he in the description, hopefully I don't forget. But through familial DNA, that's how they were able to find him. So here you have again, where they found a DNA that did not match the, where like this DNA, the, I'm not, we're not too sure that this DNA should be here. We don't know the connection yet. Kaylee's dad is said to have said there is a connection between him and Kaylee. We don't know what that is. We don't know if he spoke out of turn. We don't really know much, right? We're still learning. But this way that they find genetic genealogy, the way they find other people, wow, wow, wow. This could very well be how they were able to trace him. Let me share with you what I have found. C.C. Moore, who is the chief genetic genealogist at Parabon and founder of DNA Detectives, she has helped law, or they have helped law enforcement 
solved more than 240 crimes. Now, she did not work on this case, but she is why they're widely considered to be the most authoritative expert in the industry and so there was an interview done with her and she explained the process that the fbi likely followed based on her own understanding the first step in the investigation is finding a dna sample at the crime scene which we found and so they find the dna in this Idaho case, the alleged crimes were so physical and brutal that it would have been easy for the killer to accidentally leave their own BLOOD. That's according to CC Moore, again, the chief genetic genealogist at Parabon and founder of DNA Detect. And she, Cor Moore said, if this is the KI Lur, then I'm sure he sure he tried. I'm sure he's sure he tried very hard not to leave behind a sample given his background in forensics, but it's almost impossible not to, even if he was suited up like Dexter. Now, personally, I feel like the show Dexter is going to come up multiple times. As you, as you know, when we were finding this out, I literally, when we got his name, my first thought was this guy was trying to be like Dexter. and. Be, a, be in the field and commit these crimes. I'm surprised that's not talk, talked about more in reference to him. You know, the hit series, Dexter. I've literally always felt like he had, like there's, like he might be trying to be Dexter. Again, I'm theorizing. I could be completely wrong. Now, Moore says, when you're in a frenzy, stabbing someone it's extremely common for the knife to slip and for you to get cut even if he had gloves on i truly have said that multiple times the blood could have been mixed with the victims when that happens you have to be you have to deconvolute it that could have been what happened we also know that one of the victims put up the fight of her life Zana is what we believe if that is true she may she maybe was able to scratch him and they could have collected DNA from her fingernail. That is the most credible possibility that we will have until that affidavit is released. I truly believe Dana helped capture this guy. Again, I'm theorizing I could be wrong. Building a DNA profile and running it through police databases is what they do when DNA is found at the scene. So they're gonna build a complete profile and they're gonna run it through the databases, which we know even Nancy Grace shared, they did that and no one came up in CODIS, meaning he was not someone that, was, that has been in trouble before. And so the first thing police do is run it through their own database to check if it matches the DNA of any previous offender. And this test, the sample, uh, this test, the sample against 20 DNA markers, which is enough to identify the person if their own DNA is already in the system or if there is immediate relative in the system, a parent or a sibling. If both strike out, investigators have to look for genetic genealogy to perform a wider search for more distant relatives. That is what I believe they did. So they go through different parts, right? So. First, the test go. They, they this tests the sample, so they're testing the sample against 20 DNA marks, which is enough to identify the person if their own DNA is already in the system. Now, when it's found at the cis, at, at the scene, it if it does not belong, again, the first thing they do is run it through their own database, see if there's anything there. Nothing there. Okay, let's run it through the sample against 20 DNA markers oh it's still not there okay let's go a little further and let's go check genetic genealogy so all along when all these people are doing these dna trees to find which we're gonna probably do that as well to see like who are we connected to on our where are we come from you know things like that a lot of people i know a good friend who recently found their sister through that little do we know that we're also opening it up for them to find and study the humans even a little deeper. And honestly, if it's gonna help find creepers like this, 
I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. And so then if those other two don't work, then you got the genetic genealogy, which again is the wider scale to, to see any distant relatives. Now, unlike police DNA databases, those of commercial genealogy companies, they can search for up to 1 million DNA markers creating a much wider pool of relatives that may be in their system all across all of the markers out there. That gives the, the police a lot wider audience to see if there's any type of match. And when you think about it, to only now get all of this done in less than seven weeks, wow, now that I see all this, right? While there are many commercial ancestry websites, only two allow law enforcement to search their databases openly. That's what CC Moore is sharing. And only, th there's a huge, this is what she shares, there's a huge misconception that we use Ancestry.com and 23andMe but we don't. Only the two smallest databases, GED Match and Family Tree DNA, do allow it, and they deal with around two million people. She sh continued, so with that, you have to either get lucky or be really skilled. Now, Kohlberger's likely matches from those two databases are second, third, and fourth cousins. That's what CC Moore is sharing, not his closest relative. In most criminal cases, Moore said that the suspect who is eventually identified has likely never met most of the people he or she shares DNA with. Wow. So the person that might have even led to him may not have been officially, uh, they may not even know each other. They're related through the pipeline, through the DNA line, but they may not even know each other. So she says you get a match list which will have hundreds or even thousands of people on it and most will only share tiny amounts of DNA. You're really hoping for a second cousin, but probably in the case they were working with third, fourth, and fifth cousins. She continues, sometimes you get lucky and it's a first cousin or even a sibling or parent, but it's very rare. She says, you're looking for patterns and commonalities and you need to find that one person who is related to all of the people at the top of the list. Before we find who they are, we need to find what all the other people on the list have in common and who they have in common. Then she says, you work forward from that and build out the family tree. And so they will use social media to build that family tree. They will use the public birth and death records to build a family tree. They will even use more to build a family tree. When the genetic genealogy trail runs cold, investigators, they have to look at other ways to narrow down a list of suspects. She shares, when we get a match in GED match of family tree DNA, the vast majority of the time there is little information there. We have to figure out who's this person? Who are their grandparents? Then when we are building forward in time, it's really hard work. She says, once you get past the 1950 census in the US, there aren't any more records, so we have to start using newspaper articles, birth records, and state databases. You can learn a lot from social media too. That is what CC Moore is sharing. And she says, as you come closer and closer to the present day, it becomes harder. In the US, we have search databases, basically these companies that collect information on all of us and compile it and sell access to these databases. She continues, like white pages or been verified or US search, you can put their name in and see who they are connected to. It's really difficult and time intensive. And honestly, that's what a lot of internet sleuths do. They spend a lot of this intense time to try to find answers, to try to help law enforcement, to try to be the one that solve the problem, to solve the case, to be one of the first ones that can break and say, this is what happened. Now, at the flip side is, they can go the wrong direction in very many ways. This name, BK, never came up once. Never. In all the people were that were thrown out there, Jack S, Jack D, fraternity, parents, 
no one leaned towards this guy who lived less than 10 miles away from the crime scene was studying this stuff. Generally, if they're studying it, it's to get into the field, not commit that part of the field. And so that's what we are learning in this particular case as well, right? And CC Moore, she says, in the UK, it would be extremely difficult and impossible sometimes because of the privacy restriction. That's what she is sharing. She says, in Canada, it's extremely difficult for the same reason. In a way, we are fortunate, but on the other hand, if someone is worried about privacy, they should really be thinking about those databases, not the DNA website. Very interesting point that she shares there. She says, your DNA is meaningless if I can't build the family tree. And then she continues into the narrowing down a suspect. Once the genetic genealogy trail has run cold, the investigators start looking at possible suspects based on other factors. Once we narrow it down, she says, to say grandparents, you've got to say, who are their grandchildren? Who is living in the right place at the right time who's the right age. From their DNA, we can also predict skin color, hair color, eye color. In this case, it's possible they didn't have enough to get all the way to his immediate family. Then they got to his grandparents and had to look at the male descent. Wow, and how they find it. And she says, then they'd say, who drives the white Elantra? And obviously, you know, that is where I, I mean, they were searching for this white Elantra for a minute, for a while, I know. And the vehicle was spotted in the area around the time of it, right? So when they're matching a the DNA, all right, who has a white car that might match this DNA, right? Who might live in this area, right? Which man could it be? Well, we got, this Brian guy who lives not far from the crime scene. Oh, we got family members who has a registered car, white Elantra car registered to them, right? Interesting. So I find that very interesting in that, how they're able to do this. We see why DNA led, but again, I feel like they're gonna need more, but again, we don't even know what's in that affidavit. And so CC Moore, she says, it's possible they got 10 male descendants. They look then at whether any of them fit. She says, once they found Kohlberger's white Elantra, it will have been a huge aha moment. Then they can match him because they follow him, right? And she continues, plus the fact he lives just seven miles away, most of the time the genealogy, most of the time the genealogy leads you right back to the scene of the crime. And she says, once a suspect is nailed down, genealogical investigators turn their findings over to the police. And so then undercover or covert teams then follow the suspect and kind of without the suspect knowing, obtain a sample from them in order to compare it to the sample that is found at the crime scene that was used in the DNA tracing. My friends, this is all coming together to literally understand how they got him. And let me tell you, unless he has the best reasons as to why he was at that crime scene, he's in trouble. He is in trouble. Because as she is describing this, I'm finding a lot to understand. Like, holy mackerel, I feel like I'm getting a complete education in DNA tracing when it comes to law enforcement and how they tracked BK to this crime scene and to the white Elantra, you know they find some stuff. I know that they got more coming. They got so much more coming. And so then we know that they were tracking this guy for four days starting right before Christmas. Remember, he goes home for the holiday. So they already know he's in car with someone. Oh, that's his dad, right? And so they follow him without him knowing and grab his DNA without him knowing. And so now they have a sample from him, now they can compare it to the sample that's found at the crime scene. That is you, how DNA tracing is used. Moore, CC Moore, who has turned over similar evidence to cops 250 times 
through her company. Company says this part of the process is often carried out in the same way it is portrayed in films and TV shows. Yay, something that they actually say, this is like the TV shows. Genetic genealogy is only a lead generator. It's not evident. Interesting. She says, it can be used to arrest anyone or in a warrant. We'll write a report up, explain how we came to the conclusion, to this conclusion, then law enforcement have to take this information and do a full investigation. It's a highly scientific tip, but police still have to start from scratch once they get it. They have to go and collect their DNA, which they do by following them. We've heard that's what's happened in this case. That's exactly what we have found out, right? And so she says, people don't get arrested based on my work alone. Yes. They have more, and now that we know he's gonna be extradited and get back to Idaho, be served his papers, we'll find out what that more is. And CC Moore says, what they get arrested for is once law enforcement has collected their DNA, and she says surrept uh, surreptitiously, 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 and compared it against the sample found at the scene using only 20 DNA markers, and the lab says this is a match, hopefully when they can arrest, prosecute, and hopefully convict. And as we know, they were tracking them this whole time as a way to literally, literally be able to get that warrant, right? We know that for a fact. They were tracking him the whole time in order to, to get that, that arrest warrant in hand, ready to go. And so in the meantime, they just kept tracking the perp, the suspect. So with that, we know four days of tracking him. When they actually got that piece of DNA, because again, we know all along DNA. The cop said DNA is what led them to him. And now we learn from a DNA expert how law enforcement would attain that legally, because this is said to be all legally and now that they've processed that and went through the the 20 dna markers and then the lab says uh yeah we got a match folks let's here he is let's go even further again they needed more than just that and she says that the genetic genealogy portion is not presented to the jury it's not something that needs to be explained in court that's what she is sharing. She says, there are teams all over the country doing this on so many cases, following these suspects that have been identified, collecting cups and napkins, and sometimes they'll go through their trash. They've used envelopes that have been licked. We have seen this in crime scenes, we or in crime shows. We have seen this in First 48. We have seen this in so many different how they found their perp. Have we not? So literally, if you are a true crime follower, then you know, yeah, this stuff does sound familiar, doesn't it? Literally, this does sound familiar, at least to me, who does follow a lot of this. What do you think about that? Literally, what do you think? D does that sound like this is all so plausible, isn't it? To me it is anyway. What what do you think about that? Because personally, it's putting two and two together for me to be completely honest with you, literally. And so now CC Moore, she's sharing. She is literally sharing in an interview that she did and she is the founder of Parabon and, and Parabon and founder of DNA Detective. And so I think that there's a lot of credibility. She has helped law enforcement solve more than 240 crimes. Now, again, she did not work on this case. Let me make sure that I'm very clear. And so she says, we leave our DNA behind everywhere. Once you've been identified as a potential suspect, they're going to get your DNA. Police, they have not revealed their evidence against them because the paperwork, the affidavit, the arresting charges, and everything that they have around him cannot be made public yet. Again, today is the day that he's going to be extradited. So over the next 24 to 36 hours, 
we should have some more information, folks. But they have not revealed what kind of DNA evidence that he left at the scene either. So we don't even have that. But Moore said that the case highlights the need to run genetic genealogy testing immediately after an unidentified sample is collected from a scene. And what that means is they had found a bunch of DNA and then they were able to connect the DNA dots like, oh, this DNA goes to this person, let's talk to him. This DNA goes to this person, let's talk to him. And so forth and so on. But then when they started getting DNA that they could not match with anyone, that's when the digging went deeper. I am I'm loving the process of how they're finding the creeps like this alleged perp. Again, he's just a suspect at the time. We don't know. He is due his day in court. But right now, it's really looking like you better have some answers as to why your DNA was found at the crime scene. C.C. Moore says, I've been advocating for using this immediately as soon as they don't get that first hit using the police databases. It looks like that's exactly what they did here. Again, this is her side of what she's seeing too. So we also have to realize that as well. But my gosh, I'm buying into her side right now. Let me tell you that. It can't, she says, it can stop criminals in their tracks and prevent other people from being hurt. This can stop serial kills and ra you know what, rapists, because we can identify them after the first time. She said this could have been a Ted Bundy or a Zodiac. I totally agree. I believe that this was something that was gonna happen a lot more, a lot more if we did not get this guy out there much, much sooner, right? He to me, in my mind, was going to do more unthinkable things. This is just getting started. Thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning in. And hit that subscribe button if you're not already a subscriber. My goal is to keep you updated and be a voice for the victims. Until next time, have a great one. Peace.